This video is about judge not. Hi, I'm Bake Adafi and this is Bible Study Verse by Verse. We're studying through a book of the Bible a verse at a time. This series of lessons is on the book of Romans in the New Testament. If you'd find your Bible and open it to Romans chapter 2, we'll begin in just a moment. Romans is the Bible book we're studying. This is lesson nine, and we're starting with chapter two and verse one. If you'd find your Bible and follow along, we'll read Romans chapter two, verse one through three. Therefore, it says, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are that judges. For wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge do the same things. Verse 2, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who commit such things. And do you think, verse 3, O man who judges those who do such things and does the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God? Very good question. Let's pray. Father, we ask for your mercy that we can have your Holy Spirit to understand this section of Scripture to be able to apply it in our lives to those around us as we look at them and look at ourselves to apply your word to, to each. Lord, we thank you that you've commanded us here not to judge while we're doing the same thing. Lord, help us to understand what that really means. Help us to see you clearly. Help us to see how the Lord Jesus has forgiven all of the sins of all his people who trust in him, who repent, and who turn to him, and who commit themselves to him. Lord, give us that kind of faith, and give us the kind of faith that understands spiritual discernment and judgment. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Romans chapter 2, verse 1, what does it mean to judge not? Inexcusable judgment. Romans 2, verse 1 says, Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judges. For wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge do the same things. This idea of judgment is probably the most well-known idea in the Bible uh, today. It used to be John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life or everlasting life. That has been eclipsed probably by this idea of don't judge me. People say uh, when you're witnessing to them or their behavior is shown up to be wrong according to the Bible, they say, well, you can't judge me. Don't, don't judge me. You know, l leave me alone. Let me do my own thing. I want to be my own person. You know, you can't put your morality onto me. There are four kinds of judgment that we'll talk about. This is judgment of people to people idea in the Bible. Uh, the first one is the one we find here. This is condemning someone for something that you yourself are doing secretly. When your judgment is to condemn another person for what you're doing, um, and it's not known by them that you're doing it. This is hypocrisy. This is self-promotion. You're going to lift yourself up at the expense of the other person. This is what is meant here by judging and where we'll spend most of our time. The second kind of judging is a spiritual kind of judgment in order to discern right and wrong, in order to be able to not do the wrong thing and do the right thing and please God. Uh, we find it in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 15. It says there, But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So judging all things means you use the mind of Christ, which you have, and the Holy Spirit of God, which you have, and the conscience that God has given you, and the brains that God has given you, to look at a situation and determine what God's will is for you in that situation, and avoid sin and do what pleases God. 
That's what this is talking about, this second thing. This is the benefit of being saved, to be able to scrutinize, to be able to investigate the truth and to know it in order to please God in your life and avoid sin. It's like having a spiritual radar. Your radar is on, you detect a problem, and you avoid that problem. That's the benefit of being saved. The third kind of judgment is to help other people when they're in a sin and help them out of that sin, help them to avoid that sin. Matthew 7, 5 says, You hypocrite! <laughs> Here's the words of the Lord Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. You hypocrite, first cast the beam out of your own eye, then you sh shall see clearly to cast the mote out of your brother's eye. So, uh, beams and beams and moats, splinters and logs, uh, whatever this is talking about. I mean, it's it's saying in order to help somebody else, don't be doing the same thing. Take whatever, uh, take take a good close look at your own life, clean it up, make sure it's pleasing to God. Then you'll be able to help somebody else, and that's proper for us to be able to help somebody else. Uh, it's not judging them to condemn them; it's judging them to help them. Uh, when your own life is cleaned up. That's the third kind of judgment. Um, make sure you've got your own sin taken care of, then help the other person with their sin. Then there's a fourth kind. That's the kind that is usually uttered by unsaved people today. Um, it, it, it means, don't judge me, butt out of my business, stay away from me, I'll determine what's right and wrong for myself. No one tells me what to do, now, there's an example of this uh, back in Genesis. And uh, the, uh, it has to do with uh, Lot and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot lives in Sodom. Uh, God has determined to de destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and the plain. Everything is going to be burned to a singe there. And two angels come to Lot's house to get him out of there before this destruction happens. And as they, they come, Lot brings them into their house, his house. They eat dinner. Uh, they're about to go lay down to go to sleep. And the men from all quarters of the city surround the house. And they want these two, uh, I don't, I'm sure they don't know their angels, but they want these two people brought out to them. They want to know them. It's a euphemism for uh, a, a, a homosexual um, activity with them. And the whole town wants to do this to them. I mean, it's awful. And, and Lot... Uh, goes out by himself. He tells them, don't do this thing. This is wicked. I'll give you my daughters. They don't want his daughters. They want the men that's inside. The angels have to reach out and draw him into the house. And there's a conversation that occurs between the people who are trying to get these angels to come out to them and Lot. And one of the things that they say to Lot is, uh, they say, stand back. In other words, give us room here. We're, we're going to go in there and get those men. And they say again, this, this fellow, Lot, came in to, to sojourn with us. In other words, just to, just to live here. And it, will he be a judge over us? Will he, will he be a judge? Now we'll deal worse with you than with them. And they press sore upon the man, even Lot, to break down the door. And you understand that the angels smote the people that were at the door with blindness. They couldn't find the door, but they didn't stop. Their lust was extreme in the extreme they pull lot back in and the next morning they all leave and the city's destroyed but their their question is to lot is are you going to be a judge over us it's the same idea this fourth idea of judgment you're not going to judge us we'll do what we want to do uh, we understand right and wrong according to us and that's what the fourth kind of is, is about but back to the judgment in romans chapter 2 verse 1 this is judging others for the same thing that you're doing yourself secretly that they don't know about, but you condemn it in other people. This is judging other people for the same things you do yourself. Pointing the finger at them while behind the scenes you're doing the same thing. You're putting them down to raise yourself up. Romans 2.1 says, You who judge do the same things. What do we call a person who does this? Well, they're called hypocrites. There's at least a couple kinds of hypocrites in the scripture. One 
tells you what you should be doing well they won't do it themselves <laughs> they'll tell you all about what you should do but they're not going to do it we find this the couple examples one is in matthew chapter 23 verses 2 through 4 it says they're saying the scribes and the pharisees sit in moses seat the scribes and the pharisees the religious leaders at the time that that jesus uh, was doing his ministry sat in Moses' seat. That wasn't an actual seat. It meant that they had the law and, and the Old Testament and they were the ones that uh, dispensed the teaching of that law and uh, administered it and should have uh, righteousness uh, prevail there. And they sit there and they're the representatives of, of God. They sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you to observe, that observe and do. But do not after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens, which are grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. This is hypocrisy. This is, you got to live this way. I'm not going to live that way, but you got to live that way. That's the essence of hypocrisy. The lawyers did the same thing in Luke 11:46, And he said, Jesus, woe to you lawyers. In other words, lawyers are in trouble because, I mean, when Jesus pronounces woe on you, you are in a bad way. For you load men with burdens grievous to be borne, and you yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. So they did this same thing. They loaded up people with burdens that they wouldn't themselves bear. That's one kind of hypocrisy. Another kind is the kind that we find here. It's people who are doing the same sin that they are condemning in you, but they're doing it secretly. They're doing it behind the scenes. We'll talk about some examples of this. One of them you should be familiar with is in 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is where uh, David, who's the king, a second king of the nation of Israel, it's springtime and it's the time when kings go out to battle. That's when the, the wars take place. And David has stayed behind in Jerusalem in his, in his house or his palace and he sent his army out and Joab his general out but he is being, I guess you could call slothful or lazy. He is, he's not gone out with his army. There's, uh, he's, he's had, he has idle time on his hands. He's going to really get in trouble here. Um, one of my favorite verses is in Ephesians 5.16. It says there, redeem the time because the days are evil. In other words, spend your time properly for God. Redeem it. Buy it back. Time that's just wasted is lost. It doesn't count for God. It's not profitable for the kingdom. Don't let your life be a series of times in which you don't have anything to show for the time that, you, that God has allowed you to spend on earth. Use your time wisely. Spend it wisely. Redeem the time because the days are evil. If you don't do that, if it's not redeemed, it's evil. And there's David at nighttime up on his roof with nothing to do, and he sees a woman on another roof taking a bath, and she's beautiful, Bathsheba. And he desires her, and he calls her. She comes to him. She gets pregnant. She's going to have a baby, and her husband is at the war where all the men should be. <laughs> and, and David sends for Uriah, and he brings him back, and he says, uh, under a pretense, how's the war going? Oh, it's going okay, you know. And he gets him he gives him a feast and then he says okay go home to your go home to your wife now you can go and uriah won't do it he stays outside the king's gate and sleeps out there with all, all the other servants and the next day david gets him drunk and says okay now you can go home to your wife and he won't do that either and he uh he stays outside with the servants at the gate and so david then writes a a, a an order to uh, Joab, to the general, and has Uriah carry it back to the battle, to, to the general. And it says in it, put this guy, Uriah, out in the midst of the battle and everybody withdraw from him and let him be killed. So that's what, uh, Uriah, uh, that's what Joab does. He, he obeys the king. 
and Uriah is dead. So David commits adultery, and then he tries to cover it up, and then he has her husband murdered. And you know how God looks at this. I mean, the thing that David did did not please the Lord, and the baby dies that, that she has. But in, in the midst of this, a prophet comes from God to David to tell him about his sin. Now, David is just papered this thing over. He doesn't even see it as being really very bad. He's the king. He does what he wants. And, and he, here's what God has to say about it. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1-7. through seven. The Lord sent Nathan to David, Nathan the prophet, and he came to him, and he said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and, brought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children, and did eat of his own meat, his own food, and drink of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was to him as a daughter. And there came a traveler to the rich man. And he spared, he was unwilling, to take of his own flock, and of his own herds, to dress or to prepare for the wayfaring man that was come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb, and dressed it, which means he killed it, he prepared it, for the man who was come to him. And David reacts to this story that Nathan has told him. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, this man that has done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he has no pity. And Nathan said to David these famous words, you're the man. <laughs> you the man. This is your sin. And of course, David is convicted of this. David doesn't see himself until Nathan comes and points this out to him. I mean, we have Psalm 51 as a result of this sin, where David is repenting and asking God for cleansing and asking God to come, and ba come back into his life. I mean, that's an excellent psalm if you want to read about repentance and what it really means. David judged himself harshly when he didn't know it was him. That's this kind of judgment. He thought himself above the law, which only applied to other people. But he condemned himself, and he didn't escape the judgment of God. A second example is the religious leaders, when they brought a woman who was caught in adultery to Jesus for judgment. Jesus is teaching in the temple. People are surrounding him. He's teaching them. And these religious leaders show up, this woman. They throw her down in, on the ground in the midst of this. And, and they know they've got Jesus. They've caught him. He's, they've set a trap for him. There's no way out for him. They say Moses and the law commands that, that this woman be stoned. In other words, we, we don't have any choice. We have to kill her. What do you say? What do you say about the law? They're, they're, they're trying to trick him. They're trying to put him in a trap where if he says kill her, then Rome's going to say, well, you don't have the authority to kill anybody. And if he doesn't say kill her, they're going to say, well, you don't obey the law. So Jesus, well, let me read it to you. John 8, verse 3 through 9. And the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman taken in adultery. And when they set her in the midst, they said to him, Master, this is a greeting that is uh, false, you know, they don't consider him a master. This woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Where's the man? Well, we never know what happened to the guy. I mean, why isn't he there too? And they, they said, tempted, this they said, tempting him, that they might have something to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote in the ground as though he'd heard them not. One of the preachers I listened to said that, you know, he's probably writing their names of their girlfriends in, in the dirt are the people that are accusing her. So when they continued, that's an imagination, by the way. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone in her. Excellent answer. And again, stooped down and wrote on the ground. And those who heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. 
And Jesus was left alone with a woman standing in the midst. These people who came to discredit him in front of all the people that he was teaching are now discredited themselves. And they all leave. And there's no one left to accuse her of this sin. I mean, Jesus put his finger on their hypocrisy. They're telling, I mean, they were probably guilty of this very thing. And he, he points it out. And they are, they are undone by it. Their conscience won't let them continue on to kill this woman. That's what this is talking about. Judging other people for the things that you do. This attempt backfired as they were caught in their own hypocrisy. And they were the ones discredited in front of all those people that were present. So, verse 1 begins with a therefore. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, you are inexcusable. This is a strange twist. It comes from Romans chapter 1, verse 32, where it says, Who, knowing the judgment of God, that those who commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in those who do them. Chapter 1 of Romans, verse 1 through 32, is a litany of uh, people who turn their back on the truth, will not listen to it, and make idols, and sin, and God turns his back on them and gives them up. Um, the the uh, judgment of God is against those who commit such things. 118 says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven on all those who hold the truth and unrighteousness. And those people get left to homosexuality. And then there's a list of 23 sins that are, are gross that they are committing. Uh, they have a reprobate mind. And then it comes down to the last verse in that chapter where they are not only doing the sins themselves, they are promoters of sin. They are telling people how good it is. They are taking pleasure in getting other people to commit that same sin with them. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, there's a twist. The, the people that are sinning are hiding that sin and they're condemning it in other people. They're sinning against knowledge also, but they're sinning secretly, also they think. This is self-condemnation. It's passing sentence on yourself. And it's inexcusable, verse 1 says. You are inexcusable. There's no defense for this. Matthew 7, 1 through 5 says, Judge not so that you will not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, or what, what measure you allot, it shall be measured to you again. And why do you behold the moat that is in your brother's eye, but, but consider not the beam that is in your own eye? That is, splinters and logs, what it's talking about. Or how will you say to your brother, let me pull the moat out of your eye, and behold, the beam is in your own eye? You hypocrite! First cast the beam out of your own eye, and then you shall see clearly to cast the moat out of your brother's eye. God will judge you with the same judgment that you judge other people with. And it's not going to be pretty. Your standard is going to be used against you to condemn you. To judge and then do those same things that you're judging secretly is inexcusable. And verse 1 says, whoever you are, Jew, Gentile, whatever, <laughs> wherever your status is in the world, Doing this, God is no respecter of persons. We'll get to that in chapter 2, verse 11. He doesn't respect persons as far as his judgment. If you sin in the law, you get judged. If you sin without the law, you get judged. He doesn't respect persons. Those people who do this kind of thing are going to be judged by God. And he will not give them a pass in this sin. So that's what this judgment is about. Judging other people while you do the same sin that you're judging them for. Romans chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. How does God judge hypocrites? It, the judgment is according to truth. Verse 2 and 3 says, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who commit such things. And do you think, O man, who judges those who do such things and does the same? that you shall escape the judgment of God. We are sure, this verse says, this is the judgment of the apostles 
and the judgment of the church, you can know and understand that God won't fail to judge those who judge others while committing the same sins. We think, well, God's going to lower the bar for me. He'll make an exception in my case. We're special circumstances. He may judge others harshly, but not us. Or I'm not as bad as this other guy, so I'm going to be okay. However, God doesn't judge like that. He doesn't judge on a curve. I don't know if you had this when you were in school or not, but if the test was really hard and the teacher had given you a hard test and the, the very the highest grade was a, like an 80 and other people got 40, 60, um, you know, 80. And th there was a spread. There was a few people that were right up in the 80s and a few that were down in the lower in the 40s. And then there was a, 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 a distribution of the scores so that instead of an A being 100%, an A shifted down to 80%. So people that got an 80 got an A. So the people that got, you know, down in the 40s, instead of getting an F, they maybe got a D or a C. But God doesn't do that. He doesn't judge like that. His 100% is 100%. He doesn't grade on the curve. He looks inside your heart. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance, that is, his face, the way he looks on the outside, or on the height of his stature. God is talking about selecting David to be the second king of Israel. He's gone through his whole list of brothers, beautiful, beautiful children, tall, uh, you know, uh, well-formed. And then he comes to the very last one who wasn't even there at the beginning. He was out keeping the sheep, and he's small, <laughs> and he, he, he's not that attractive. Don't look at the height of his stature, because I refused him. The Lord doesn't see as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on his heart. Lord looks on the heart. That's what David, uh, how, how David was attractive to God. He is omniscient. You cannot put anything over on him. You can't trick him. He judges in accordance with truth. Romans chapter 2 verse 2 says, it's according to truth. It's not judged on a sliding scale. It's judged on 100%. I mean, when you understand this, this should send shivers up and down your spine. God gives no leeway when he judges. The law is the law, and that's what we have to measure up to. And because we sin and we don't measure up to it, we need a Savior. We need the Lord Jesus to come and stand in our place and take the penalty for our sin. I mean, that's the good news of the gospel. Our sin and the penalty of them are poured out on him. On the cross, he became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we can be the righteousness of God in him. This is the truth. He judges in accordance with truth. Jesus is the truth, John 14, 6. He bore witness to the truth. John chapter 18, verse 37. And then in John 18, 37, everyone who's of the truth hears the Lord Jesus. They hear his voice. So Pilate, in condemning Jesus, says in John 18, verse 38, he says, Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. So Pilate's, Pilate's answer is kind of like what the answer about truth is today. There is no truth. There's no, there's no standard. There's no Bible that we judge things by. There is no external standard. It's all how we feel about things. Each person is their own little God, and, and, and they determine what's right and wrong for themselves. Whereas that's not true for God. For God, his word is the standard of judgment for us, and Jesus is the standard of judgment for us. When Pilate says what is truth, what he's really saying is, I'll do what I want. Truth means nothing to me. All I'm concerned about is how I'm going to be perceived by what happens here. Or my boss is going to look down and think, well, Pilate's really blown it. Let's replace him or let's, let's remove him from that place. What's going to happen to me is what he's saying when he says what is truth. He asked that kind of question. There's nothing actually true in Pilate's thinking. It has no bearing on his passing judgment. He's all, his only concern is himself and what will happen to him politically. And 
the truth doesn't matter to him. I'll do what suits me. But God's judgment is according to truth. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, He is the rock, talking of God. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. All the ways of God are judgment. He judges according to truth. His work is perfect. He has no iniquity in him. Judgment that is without truth really makes God mad. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. When you disregard the truth, when you disregard God's word, when you disregard the creator of everything and make an idol out of men or beasts or birds or creeping things, when you make an idol, God is extremely angry about that. He's angry at all who hold the truth and unrighteousness. For that reason, he gives up on them to uncleanness and to dishonor themselves. Romans 1, 24 and 25 says, Wherefore God gave them up, because they didn't obey the truth, to uncleanness, to, lust of, to the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Verse 25 of Romans chapter 1, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Change the truth into a lie, and God gives up on you. Then comes homosexuality. Then comes a list of horrible sins. There are 23 of them in Romans chapter 1. Then people who delight in the sin of others, and to get them sin, and they have pleasure in that. And then to the place where we are now in the Scripture, in Romans chapter 2, verse 1, where people are doing the same sins, but they're condemning them in other people. Well, God judges according to truth. He's omniscient. He sees your heart. He's against those who commit such things. And there's no escape from God's judgment. Verse 3 says, Do you think, O man, who judges those who do such things and does the same? that you shall escape the judgment of God? What's the answer to that? Well, it's a rhetorical question, and the answer is no, of course not. You won't escape the judgment of God. Common sense tells you that if you're correctly condemning someone else for a sin, that God's going to condemn you if you're doing that same sin. The, judgment, the, the judge is not uninformed about your crimes. He lacks no power to carry out a sentence against you. There is no escaping his judgment. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are every place, beholding the good and the evil. You think you can do something because it's night and because other people don't see you? Night and day don't mean a thing to God. He knows everything. He sees everything. There's no place you can go to escape him. Psalms 139 verse 7 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Rhetorical question. You can't escape that. Where shall I free from your present? You can't escape the presence of God. Here's a good question. Abraham makes this statement about God when reasoning with him over the destruction of, of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18.25. He says there, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the answer is a rhetorical question. This rhetorical question is, yes, God will do right. He sees everything. There's no way to escape him, and he will do right. Here's a good question to ask. The outwardly righteous people, the people that are inwardly full of hypocrisy and iniquity. In Matthew 23, verse 28, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? The answer is they won't escape it. God is going to use your standard of judgment to judge you and condemn you for doing the things in secret that you condemn in other people that you judge. Matthew 7, 2 says, For what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet or allot, 
it shall be measured to you again. Oh, be very careful how you judge other people when you're doing that same sin. Cast that sin out of your life and that you may be able to judge properly and help another person uh, escape from their trap of sin in their lives. There are four kinds of sin that the Bible talks about that people do. Using judgment to avoid sin, that's a good thing. Spiritual judgment, don't sin. Using judgment to help other people, not to sin, that's a good thing. And then the kind which is inexcusable that we do, where we do the sin that we condemn in other people, that you do secretly while you're condemning them. And then there's the sin that says, don't judge me. I don't care what the law says. I don't, have, I don't have any standard but myself. And I'll do what I want and you can't tell me what to do. God is omniscient. He knows about all of us. And he knows our thoughts and our actions before we do them. And his judgment is in accordance with truth. He's not like us who can be living a lie. There's no escape from the judgment of God. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men and ungodliness who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Will not the judge of the earth, of all the earth, do right? Yes, he will. Amen and amen. So to the hypocrite, beware. When you judge other people for the same sin that you're doing secretly, you're in big, big trouble. Lord, help us. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your graciousness to us to teach us from your word about how to live properly before you and to have a proper estimation of your law and what sin is. Give us spiritual discernment that we can discern for ourselves how to avoid sin and spiritual discernment that we can help other people to avoid it. Don't let us fall into this trap, Lord, of thinking that we are not going to be judged for the sins that we do and we condemn in others. But, but help us to know that when we're condemning others, we are also condemning ourselves with that same judgment. Lord, be gracious to your people. Show mercy, Lord. Uh, give them your spirit. Help them to trust in the Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. In the next lesson, Lesson 10, we're going to start with Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. I hope the Lord blesses you as you study His Word. If you have questions or comments on this lesson, you can email me at all one word, Bible study, v by v at gmail.com. And please don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more Bible study, verse by verse. Mm -hmm.